All right, and we're back for another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Lakers Fast Break. Pop Culture Cosmos, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at the Lakers Fast Break. Pop Culture Cosmos, and Lakerholics.com, plus the great folks at the Hoop Heads Podcast Network. It is sincerely appreciated. Well, we got to talk to Joe Sorrell of Lakersball.com recently. I also got a chance to talk to my good friends at Lakerholics.com, Magic Man Sean Grice, also as well Laker Tom, and of course Spencer Young from Basketball University. All of us are talking about the Lakers and what they did in the offseason, but also who might be some contenders to the throne as well for next year's championship. But here today to share his thoughts on which player outside of the big three may make a difference on the Lakers team, plus some early thoughts on the Western and Eastern Conference, and his thoughts on his all-time top 10 Lakers team, because he hasn't even weighed in on that yet. He's a good man indeed. You got to go ahead and check out what he's doing today at five things. Okay. Five stars you give five me stars, on right, Apple exactly. Podcasts, yes. And you give him five things on Lakerholics.com. Exactly. It is, yes, it's our own Admiral Akbar himself, Jamie Sweet. And Jamie, great to have you back on. Glad you could make it this time around. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, yeah, I can't can't Admiral Akbar the offseason, I feel like. I mean, I guess you could. Uh, you could, but trust me, you could. <laughs> yeah, take that back. We could get you. The Akbar be Mozgov is what that would actually Otto should be called. So uh, yeah, and then Luol Deng as well. <laughs> we're still be, we're still being Luol Deng. We're still for one more year. Uh, this is one the, more this year. Is the, dang, it's the final year. <laughs> yes, yes, Deng indeed. Wow. But <laughs> dang. great to have you here, my friend. Uh, before we get to the all-time top ten Lakers for you, because you've already heard the list, especially from the guys at Lakerholics.com. Wanted to go ahead and talk to you first off. Lakers, Lakers, Lakers. We'll get it started into that right now. We obviously know that Russell Westbrook is here. You're a big fan of it, which kind of surprised me because we kind of deviated a little bit on that for once. Usually we do the tag team on, on Laker Tom and that handicap match. But today <laughs> it's it's you are actually aligning yourself with Team Laker Tom in the fact that you actually – fully endorse the Russell Westbrook trade and signing and whatnot. I, I I like it, but again, for me, it's more about the playoffs and the fit for the playoffs and the matchups for the playoffs as opposed to anything he'll do in the regular season because I think he'll be just fine in the regular season. I think he'll go ahead and his motivation and the way he plays each and every game, I think that if provided he's healthy and if the Lakers are healthy, I think it's going to be a nice 50-plus win season whether or not they want to stay at number one or be number one. I think that's really up to them at this point, you know, as long as they're healthy, because we've seen before where they just go into cruise control and, you know, say, okay, yeah, we're just waiting for the playoffs and whatnot. And we can gauge that over the course of the season and we can actually tell when that's happening, but which player outside of that, because the Lakers made a whole bunch of moves. And (laughs) we actually remarked on this on the other show with the Lakerholics crew that the bubble was a fantastic. The Lakers won the championship in the bubble. But since then, in less than 12 months, they've gotten rid of everybody outside of THT, LeBron, and AD. And even at the end of this past season, a couple months ago, they've gotten rid of everybody outside of those three and Marcus Saul. Right. A whole new roster, basically. Right. Right, yeah. So no, it's, I, it's astounding. Yeah, but, not even the two-way guys they kept. But I want to hear your thoughts, my friend, on this. Well, thank goodness that. That's and, your, and your good friend, Mr. Laker Tom's good friend, I should say, Jared Dudley, he has, as of yet, has not been signed. Thank goodness. And that's yeah, not the same way. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, I like Duds, but, you know. If you, kind you need of, players. If you, well, you That's need players like that, that. Yeah, you need players that can actually play and actually do things for you out on the court. But be that as it may, my friend, I mean, which Laker player will make the biggest difference to you after the big three? Jared Dudley. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, you want to get uh, kicked I, off the show? I know, right? No, 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 never. Um, you know, I think this is this is going to be a little weird. I think it's going to be uh, Kendrick Nunn for me. Um, 
if Kendrick Nunn can make enough plays to either slot in as, you know, the other guard next to Russell Westbrook so that Russ has a shooter that can also handle the ball or, you know, there's a little bit more playmaking out there. Uh, if he can force his way onto the court consistently, especially in crunch time uh, on the defensive and offensive end, I think that's a great thing for the Lakers because you would want to hopefully see somebody who's young sort of merging with AD in some way um, in a, in a career arc that matches with AD more than LeBron or, or, or Russ, you know what I mean? Like I, that's like a two issue window, but hopefully AD is for another contract after this one in theory, right? Like that would be the hope. Uh, so who plays with AD after this contract? And I think for this season, you know, if none's making a difference on both sides of the court at the one of the guard positions, you know, that's a lot more than we were getting out of the two guard positions last season. Uh, so between if Westbrook can find a way to both be productive without taking any way from anything away from uh, LeBron or Anthony Davis, I think that's going to be the biggest key to this, both the regular season and the off season. I think you're following the lead of what most people are saying. Uh, most people have interviewed and myself as well, that I think Kendrick Nunn, outside of the big three, may be the only individual that scores in double figures. Even with Carmelo Anthony, one of the top 10 scorers right. of all time, I think he's going to be limited in his playing time and thus his effectiveness out there on the court. I think that will save him maybe for either later in the season or in the playoffs as far as to give him more blow then. And if that's the case, you will not see him actually score in double figures, maybe around nine points a game. We're thinking that, right. give or take, maybe 10. I'm not sure, but... I think if there's any one player that's going to score in double digits outside the big three, it's going to be Kendrick Nunn because he's got something to prove. I know yeah, Malik Monk right. has something to prove, but he's very inconsistent in his pass and his defense is very right. suspect. So we don't know how much burn he's going to get. Right. All the that's other guys, the yeah, they're, they're all over 30. So we don't know how much they're going to give us. The one mitigating factor throughout all this is Kendrick Nunn. And the fact mm -hmm. that he – signed the contract that he did with one year and an option. And I don't think if he plays well enough, he's going to keep that option. He's going to be right. out in the free agency and, and hopefully right. the Lakers can do what they can to sign him. Because if he goes out there next year and wants a big contract and plays like he wants a big contract, unlike Dennis Schroeder, and I love burning that in on there, <laughs> I think that he will be there having a great season. I think he'll have a, yeah. be having that living up to that a lot of that potential that I thought he could have lived out in Miami. So I'm looking forward to that. I think Kendrick Nunn is a step that's uh, probably the, the right pick to make at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, my wild card is whom whomever plays at center, whatever they play, somebody not Anthony Davis at center, whatever, whomever, whatever that is. That's kind of my wild card because I feel like. I mean, the, the, my number one thing going into the next season is I feel like Anthony Davis has to play it at an MVP conversational level for us to have any shot at all of doing anything special in the playoffs. Um, if he's having kind of like a, yeah, I'm here tonight and kind of here the next night and yeah, you know what I mean? If he's that kind of up and down, like he, he was as much more, you know, more or less, more so last season than the season before, but and you can't, you know, I'm not saying just always like scoring 30 points or, you know, double digits, this or that, but just the effort and the focus um, that you can sometimes see comes and goes uh, that it, that it, I don't feel like it does for uh, Russell Westbrook ever <laughs> or yeah. LeBron James. Um, so that's, I think, you know, the, that's, I feel like another thing that Russ is going to bring is, is, a, is a fire and a focus because he hasn't won a, a ring. Uh, he, he's, he's taken a lot of flack uh, and, you know, I think he would very much enjoy winning a ring in any way, shape, or form, as many players would. But, I mean, Russ has taken a lot of flack for being, you know, a really good basketball player. Some of it, you know, I would argue, you know, well-deserved. You know, he's earned some of the he's earned some of the, the critiques. So, I agree with you on that. He has earned some of the critiques. I mean, again, I always hate to point it out, but I am going to point it out. Statistically, he is one of the worst shooters of all time. And he, even if he misses – will still continue to put the ball up and something sometimes that's going to be really really bad for the for his team that he's playing for. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know one of the old adages in basketball is, you know, 
get to get them to shoot and keep shooting until they get out of their funk with Russell. That is yet to happen. So no, he's got to make sure that, that he's got to make sure that the, the shots he right. takes are straight at the rim. I know that it's not as prevalent or as proficient as it once was when he was one of the highest statistical individuals at going to the rim. Yeah. He's still pretty good at it. I still think he, that's what he should do, do as his bread and butter. If he decides to ever commit to the pick and roll, maybe he'll be a lot more effective there. Or if he's, you know, doesn't have the ball and LeBron does, maybe use, you know, using him as a cutter. Just imagine there with his quick moves. I think he, that could be something that that would be really great if he committed to that. But a lot of ifs there when it comes to Russell Westbrook. I mean, you 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 want a good rebounding team around Russ, right? And we do. We have LeBron. We have AD. We have Russ, who's a great rebounder. Um, you know, because if let's say he shoots overall forty five percent, which would be high for him, right? Probably we're looking at like his overall shooting percentage will be 43, 44, and I mean from everywhere. If he shoots smart threes, all just that, I feel like his effectiveness will go up uh, a lot. Um, Michael H. on Lakerholics posted a, a, some stats of the type of shots that Russ should take because his pull up dribble shots are terrible from everywhere. Yep. Catch and shoot, he's like a 40% shooter. Uh, basically, it's like get to a spot and shoot from there. Don't create your own three. Like that's that that's not your thing. Like that if he can figure that out and and accept that, then I think that he will be as much of a spacer as you need him to be. He won't be the space creator that Chris Paul is. Or I mean, their games are completely different. You know, there, there's no they're two completely opposite ends of the point guard spectrum. So you know, if he can be. Decent from three. I like our chances in any seven game series. Um, and that's, I think, going back to Kendrick Nunn, where you hope that Kendrick Nunn is going into the playoffs with some mojo of some sort. So that, like, if it comes down to it and you need to be like, listen, you know, you came here to win a ring, Russ. Like, Kendrick Nunn's going on for, for the last 45 seconds and you're going to sit down because you, you know, you've shot 10 three pointers and you've missed them all. Like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if, if Frank can be that kind of coach and be able to like, if should such a situation arise or Carmelo or whoever's hot that game. Uh, and if Russ is not hot in a playoff game, it can, can that will be, those are the moments that will define next season. <laughs> uh, rest I, assured. I, I, like, as you say, very often it, it, the regular season will not define next season unless it's marred by injury or some or tragedy of some sort. You know, that's the only way. Rest assured, with Russell Westbrook down the team, it will be very interesting, whatever the outcome may be. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Yes. I mean, same for a lot of our guys, you know, but Russ especially. Dwight Russ. Russ. Yeah. 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 Dwight and Russ. Yeah. It'd be very interesting indeed. Yeah. But my friend, there's still much more to talk about on today's program. And the Western and Eastern Conference. Let's start with the Western Conference first. I mean... Vegas here still has the Lakers out as one of the favorites, the favorite coming out of the Western Conference, uh, second behind the Brooklyn Nets. And I think that's, and Laker Tom's going to scream bloody murder on this, but I think that's about right. I mean, when you consider the fact that this is a new three that's being formed as opposed to Brooklyn, which is already an established three, right. provided that they're all healthy. And the I guess the Patty Mills signing, I think, was a killer. I really think that yeah. was a good good one i really was hoping that he would end up on the team me too yeah, yeah that was that was pretty clutch for them i was like yeah that's that that basically means any one of those three can get hurt and like they can go all right patty come on yeah and, he, and it takes a lot, takes a lot of pro pressure off of joe harris right. so he doesn't feel like he has to go ahead and be the shooter right. and of course he may not be in there in times where he was choking in that in that late game yeah. scenario it may be Patty Mills there, which you might feel a lot more confident about, just the fact that he might execute a little bit better under pressure than Joe Harris would. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's they're getting a basketball mind who's also got great three pointing shoes three point shooting yeah. skills and can, you know, run yeah, he's not like, you know, he's like a Jordan Farmer like level point guard when it comes to playmaking. He's not the greatest playmaker. But he can get you some points. He'll he'll collapse the defense if he needs to, or he'll take the open he shot from shoot. three. Yeah. That's the main thing. Like they need yeah. guys that one of those three do it, drive into the rim can just go like shoot it, bro. And he went uh, to uh, the Laker Tom school of not being shy when you're shooting. So that's no, something. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that's 
he has his volume PhD. Yes. So I wanted to ask you this. Okay. Actually, you know, we'll switch to the Eastern Conference. We already started talking sure. about Brooklyn. Obviously, Milwaukee's there as the champions, and, and obviously they have their own really good three. It's just about what's being assembled around them and to get them through the season. So I think those two are pretty much set. I know everybody's been kind of up and down in Philadelphia because of the fact of what went on with the Ben Simmons saga, the fact he's not been traded yet, the fact he's still there, and we don't know about the fact is if he has improved his shooting in any way, shape, or form. I know he didn't play for Team Australia this year in the Olympics, so the people were kind of bummed about that down there, and I think that that could have helped him. I know he was working on his shot, but maybe it would have helped him if he actually did it in more of a game right. scenario, even though they weren't playing in front of crowds. I still think it probably would have been a good decision for him to make, but your thoughts on Philadelphia, Miami, uh, Atlanta, after their surprise trip to the conference finals last year, do you see any of these developing into a, I guess, maybe that that scenery where Milwaukee and Brooklyn are at right now? Do you see any of those teams sliding up, or is it another team that you have in mind? Uh, I mean, I, I break the East into three tiers. One, there's the three, there's the three at the top, which in my mind is have been pretty consistently for the last few seasons: Milwaukee, uh, Philly, and um, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, just the last, really, just last season. Not, Philly and Milwaukee, I feel like, have been on top for a lot longer, than, and Brooklyn just kind of got there when they assembled the trio. So, um, but yeah, for this season, uh, Brooklyn, and then after that, I have you know Boston. Miami, uh, even Boston might be slipping into tier three this, you know, the last couple of seasons. They haven't just had much going on in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I actually think it's one of the, which of these young teams that came out of nowhere or, you know, out of nowhere to break into the playoffs and do some damage, especially Atlanta, is the team that's like poised to start to challenge for one of those top three spots. And do you think they're ready? I mean, they were ready, obviously, this past season to get to the uh, conference finals, and one Trey Young injury away. Thank you, Ruff, right. from could it possibly even being in the finals. Right. I um, mean, the same scenario that we talk about Phoenix all the time on the show is the same scenario that Milwaukee faced. They right. got some lucky right. breaks with the other team getting injured. Same thing happened to Brooklyn, where they had injuries with an injured Hard Harden and an injured Irving. And if you know, Kevin Durant's shoe size was smaller, I mean, they would have gone on to <laughs> right. Eastern Conference Finals instead of Milwaukee. A couple of shots separated them from going home to, you know, moving ahead, and that's yeah. that's that's the beauty of the uh, NBA playoffs. But what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is there any team outside of those two? Do you, do you see Atlanta becoming maybe possibly one of those? teams that could fit that role as a as a major Eastern Conference contender. I mean, I think they've got the talent. In fact, they I could be the one to twelve, one to fifteen, have as much talent right. as any team in the Eastern Conference outside of Brooklyn. Yep. And if that's the case, I mean they can really match up well with a lot of people. The only thing is experience, but you know, as I was told to me time and time again, Laker Tom was an experience, experience. And I know it, that counts for, for quite a bit, but a lot of these young kids are growing up real fast, real soon. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they just went to the conference finals, which I think ought to count as some form of experience. So I would think so too. <laughs> same thing with same. Well, we you know we he, we always talked about Booker, and I we you know he and I had a difference of opinion on Booker. I think right. once you get to the finals, you've already gone through three rounds, twenty uh, almost twenty games. You're you're already into it. You already know what know what takes place, and you're already six games, five games, six games in. You already right. know what to expect. It's just about a matter of execution and and really the drive to do it. But yeah, when it comes to right now, Atlanta, I think is close. I, I think, think they're Atlanta, just. Uh, yeah, I think they're. I think I think you're spot on. I think Atlanta's right in that wheel of you know they kind of remind me of a younger, but potentially better version of the Portland Trailblazers from ninety nine two thousand, two thousand two thousand one. That little run of. Damon Stoudemire, Pippen, you know, 
I think Trey Young is, you know, much better than David Stoudemire ever was. Um, and he, but this team lacks like that Scotty Pippen kind of veteran guy who could still play. Yeah. I'm not saying a guy who sits on the bench and goes, you know what you ought to be doing. A guy who could be out there on the floor, like competing and playing hard. How Iguodala was like five, five years ago. In, a in, really in solid Golden number State. two. John Collins. Right. John Collins could be. could be, but we're could like, eh, could. Right. You, you could, I mean, yeah, it could be, but it hasn't, it hasn't. And that's hasn't. the thing. It hasn't yeah. yet. So that's the question. And, and is Randall going to be, I mean, Julius Randall in New York is another one. And the, what the Knicks did to kind of like keep that, keep the band together. Right. Like the Knicks had a pretty disappointing first round exit, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and they were like, well, let's try that again, which is, I feel very odd for how new york normally does things yep. uh so maybe it's just so crazy it might work uh kind of a thing i don't know uh, is julius was that the best that julius randall can be that's uh, another thing i mean he just signed the fat contract and we see what happens with these one year right. wonders where they just right. elevate their game so much they get that one all-star game under their belts then they sign the big contract and it goes all down here from there i'm not saying julius randall that will happen to him but no. He did shoot over 40% from three, and that's something he never came close to with New Orleans or L.A. If he replicates that consistently, you know, 38 to 41, right? Like, if he's a hitting in that range for his career, he's going to be a player of impact no matter where he plays, no matter who he plays with. That's going to be difficult to stop just because once he gets going downhill, he's also kind of unstoppable for the most part. So he's not a bad free throw, not a great free throw, but he's not a bad free throw. And he's not a bad passer either. He, he can make basic plays, so. They have like 500 guards on that team that are <laughs> pretty talented. And right, I mean, they, I don't know, though. I mean, it just seems like it's going to be hard for them to repeat that kind of success. I feel that way. That's those are the two teams that I'm like, right, what What do you got again? Show, show us all again. Like, cool Atlanta, cool New York. Like, you did great last season. You've got pretty much the same teams. You know, the same core guys are coming back. Not a lot of core changes between the two teams. What? Can you improve? You know, how do you improve? Do you improve with your record? Do you improve in your playout like both? You know, so that's that. Those are the two teams in the East that I think have both the most potential, uh, but the biggest challenge to like start to break through and challenge for one of those top three spots. We also mentioned some of the other teams that are there. You know, like you talked about with New York, Atlanta. There's Philadelphia, obviously. We talked about the top tier being with Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. That's good enough to get you through in a regular season, but, you know, in the playoffs. Will it be next season? Will Will it be? We don't know if Ben Simmons be be there. Don't you feel like that's – don't you feel the Ben Simmons question is the great unsettled issue of the offseason at this point? Well, it's no question when you try to ask me for players and four draft picks, it's no question I'm not going to trade for him. <laughs> right. right. Not when it's he just, plays like that in the playoffs. It's just out there, right? Yeah. Because well, he's not talking to anybody. He's not, you know, it's there's he's AWOL from, uh, you know, hanging with teammates or whatever. Well, let's say, let's say there are teams out there that could surprise and, and, you know, break up the party, so to speak. I mean, I know you mentioned Boston, which some people are on the fence on as being a competitive team and, and maybe not being so competitive, maybe just like sneaking to a play-in or the back half of the uh, playoff teams. I think that there are a couple surprise teams in order. I think one of those teams that could surprise is Toronto. If they mm-hmm. get healthy and they get their mind right, I think they've got enough wing players. In fact, they have a one – thing that I think every other team wants, and that's a plethora of wing players galore Mm -hmm. that are all long-armed, play good defense, and are able to go ahead and stretch the ball out. And so I'm hoping that, uh, you know, there's some good things for them, for the people of Toronto. But I also think that Indiana, you can't sleep on them with Rick Carlisle. He's not there to tank. I don't think they have enough talent around the team yet, around Sabonis. I'm not sure Sabonis is a number one guy. I mean, is he? no, I mean, I, I think he has as much to prove as Randall or young, uh, you know, not, uh, hasn't had much of a, you know, of all the three, Trey young has obviously taken teams furthest, had the most playoff success to date. Uh, I think, I think they need great play from other guys other than Sabonis. I think uh, he can be a number one in the same way that Jokic is, uh, but, 
he's not the scorer. He doesn't have that same scoring mentality. I feel like, and just isn't. He's just like a light version of that. And he needs yeah. a, 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 a somebody at least as equal. In the same way the Joker needed Jamal uh, before he became who he was. You know, when they were first coming up, it was kind of more of like an even-handed one-two punch, and then, you know, that changed. The knee injury, of course, set Jamal Murray back. So hopefully, yeah. you know. Uh, he gets. We, we see some more basketball from him soon. But um, yeah, I mean, Indy, Indy has a shot. I'm not. I don't know. I've. The thing with the East is those three. It's, teams, to me, it's more more competitive though than it ever has been before. These teams definitely, are a lot, a lot better. Yeah, up and down the division. I mean, even Charlotte's going to be a pretty tough, you know, play in the regular season. They're going to ball hard. You know, they've got. They've got. I love that it might might, might be the ball duo out there. Um, no, that's a while away. I mean, I understand. Uh, yeah. Lamelo has been uh, playing. Is it Lamelo or uh, yeah? It's, yeah, Lamelo, uh, Leangelo, Leangelo, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Leangelo has, been, has been playing pretty good, uh, but I still that's, think that's going to get him an end of roster two way or oh, yeah. G League at best right now. But he has something. He, at least he now looks like he might have a future, so that's good for him. But I, I think Indiana is still a step away. Charlotte still is a step away. And I, those are the teams that I feel like in this modern NBA, you know, they're the two small market teams that just can't seem to like figured out in the same way that Milwaukee did, right? Like yeah. Milwaukee was able to figure, I mean, some of that's like they were lucky enough to draft Giannis Antetokounmpo and, you know, they treated him right. Uh, and they, you know, they helped nurture his game and they never gave up on him and so on and so forth. I mean, it takes that level of commitment from a, a small market team, right? Like you need to say to somebody like, you might not be great for like eight years or five years or whatever it ends up being, but like, we're with you all the way. Same way Mark Cuban was with Dirk Nowitzki, frankly, you know, he rode Dirk, Dirk Nowitzki, for 21 years and that's uh that's kind of astounding so you know i those those two small in our land you know obviously there's a few teams that are just basically not in it at all uh you know washington is basically what are we going to see where does bradley beal end up uh east or west uh contender or re you know what, what what's happening with bradley beal uh orlando if anybody can stay healthy on that team they might fight for a play in but you know Right. I don't think that. I don't think I they don't have think that, that even. I mean, you never know. You know, injuries are what's going to. That's the thing with the East. It's like those first three teams are also the most injury prone. Like, not Milwaukee so much, but definitely Philly and definitely Brooklyn uh, had an astounding number of injuries and games missed to their to their core three guys, to the point that it did seem to affect the team in the playoffs. And so. Who's yeah? I don't know. Who wants to win the regular season more in the East is going to be a really interesting question. It will be a really interesting question as it goes along for this season. And I appreciate you giving the answer on your thoughts on the Eastern Conference. Once again, I'm talking to Admiral Akbar himself, Jamie Sweet. You got you got to go ahead and check him out today at Lakerholics.com. It is under the Five Things banner. You got to go ahead and check out his great Five Things conversations that he has right there. His Five Things articles that are slapped right there, and all the conversations that are had within where people leave their comments, their thoughts. Laker Tom, you've got Sean Grice there. You got L Rob chiming in mm -hmm. every now and then. So a lot of great things happen when you go ahead and check out the awesome articles at Five Things on Lakerholics.com. We talked about in the past Eastern and also the Lakers player, which will make the biggest difference in your opinion after the big three. So we talked about the Eastern conference already. What about the Western conference? I mean, the Western conference matchup, the Lakers again, as the favorite in the West coming from Vegas right now. I mean, that's their, the only question is if, do they remain healthy and do they really want to be motivated to go ahead and get the top spot in the West? I think that's a question of if, it's always been a question of if, because when you have a team that's talented, it's always about what motivation that you go through during the course of the season. But there's going to be other teams involved in the Western Conference and in, in hopefully at what will be a competitive dogfight in the Western Conference. A lot of people are talking about Utah. A lot of people talking about Phoenix also regaining its glory up there at the top of the Western Conference. Your thoughts on Utah and Phoenix, the numbers one and two seats last season. I think Utah might end up like a 3-4 this season. Um, I think Phoenix, 
this so last season i remember we were talking about we had the same question posed to the group and i was like you know devin booker you know could take phoenix pretty far and i think he's the top five guard in the league and was like oh no no top 10 at best and i was like yeah he's top five and i'm holding Didn't on somebody that. say top 20 did not even top 20 I don't, know, I don't remember i just remember even top five you know top 10 was like at best and i was like come on do you watch devin booker play the guy is kind of amazing so and he was amazing enough to you know take his team to the uh nba finals along with chris paul and deandre eaton but uh you know i think if i mean for me the west actually comes down to the question of which team's best players who were hurt come back the best <laughs> how does clay thompson come back how does jamal murray come back how do lebron and ad come back how do Kawhi leonard how does Kawhi? well he won't next season i don't think i, mean, I would be amazed if he plays next season i would be amazed if he plays at all uh i mean i i i, I, I do not i don't think they're expecting him to play at all then i feel like that that's wise um i think the clippers actually may end up you know, pretty low seating. Everybody involved. I, 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 I don't see this. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Uh, but you know, if 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 the Nuggets get like a fully recharged, repowered Jamal Murray, who's like ready to dominate the league, and they also have the MVP, that's a pretty devastating combination for the regular season. Um, and the same for the Lakers. If LeBron and AD come back and are as good as they were their first season together, maybe a slight step back, then that's going to make Russell Westbrook that much better. And uh, if Clay Thompson comes back, the Warriors are going to be ridiculous. <laughs> like Steph Curry was lights out for much of last season. Uh, you know, if Clay can come back and be even just 80 ish percent, 70, late high 70s, low 80s percent of who he was i think that that team has a really good chance to to do some damage in the in the west coast uh, i agree just, with you and they've just got a of the lot pedigree of, and they've got a lot of young talent if any of that young right. talent cashes in or they can cash it in on a superstar right. either or right that's a good sign for them and they could place very high once again in the western conference i think that they're that's that's my personal dark horse team i mean phoenix isn't surprising anybody anymore right utah isn't surprising or should they shouldn't be surprising anyone anymore they're you know utah utah is so solid but it reminds me very much of the malone stockton era where it's like man that team is like solid during the regular season and, you know they're tough out in the playoffs but there's just uh, you know like spider and and rudy just aren't quite good enough and like you know Clarkson is, you know, awesome off the bench, but it's not quite enough. And like, you know, yeah. Paul, Paul it, 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 there's, I don't know what it is they're missing. It's, it's, it's something, and it's, it must be frustrating to be a Utah Jazz fan. So, uh, which I'm not. So, in that regard, I'm quite lucky. Uh, and uh, you know, I so, but those teams aren't going to surprise anyone. You know, those were great teams last season. They've been good to great teams in Utah's case. Uh, you know, consistently for a couple years now. Um, you know, I don't see much coming out of Houston this season. I don't see – I see the, the Mavericks as kind of another dark horse. Like, you know, kind of with the – a lot of guys signed extensions in the offseason. And you made a point earlier that I think that holds true, like, for a lot of guys around the league this season. You just signed, like, your first big money deal. How do you respond to that? You know, how yep. does your do, – do you play at least as well as you did, you know, to earn the, in the season that you earned that money? Can you take it a step higher? Or, you know, do you fall back just a small percentage but looks devastating on, on a stat sheet? You know, a few percentage points lower shooting percentage from three or a couple less rebounds or assists per game or a couple more turnovers. And suddenly, you know, well, know, then, you know whatever that didn't, didn't, you know, then you start hearing the negative. But you know, who is going to be the person who can push through that? And I think Luca is pretty well equipped for that because he has a healthy, uh, a healthy, uh, degree of uh, disdain for what anybody can you know thinks of him or his game you know he plays his game and he plays it well so if they can if if they can figure if, if jason kidd can figure out how to unlock the potential of porzingis and luca they could be they could have the best record in the western conference i feel like that's that if i really gave it if i had to, if you put if you put me under a guillotine and said 
who's your dark horse candidate to have the Western Com best record in the West of the next season? I would say the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, because I could easily see Luca averaging like a 30 point triple double for the season. And if Porzingis averages a 15 to 20 point double double, they'll have figured out a way for those two guys to both be dominant on the floor at the same time. I agree with you on that. I mean, that's something that could, they very well surprised. They didn't have the best off season, but with what they have in Luca, I guess maybe the fact that they signed him long-term is, is a great off season for them. I know Denver is still going to be a little bit iffy because the fact Jamal Murray is not there yet and not back yet. and won't be back at some, until some point in time in the season. I think, like you said, with Golden State, they're going to surprise a lot of people out there. I think they're going to be somewhere up in the top four. I think that's a very good idea That's that that's the case. The Clippers, I still think, are going to be a playoff team. I, whether or not it's a you know, top four or bottom four seed, I think it's going to be a bottom four seed. But I, I, you know, seeing them at like sixth or seventh is something that wouldn't surprise me. So yeah. I think that that's something that you, you know, people need to think about right there. Portland. Portland's a team that this could really implode really quickly. Sacramento and, and Portland could either be like, wow, get them go, or that's the dumpster fire. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, with Sacramento, they got to win or Luke's gone. Oh, yeah. No, I think he's got – I don't think he has half a season. He could, have like I, just, he could be fired just a few games in. I mean, he'd have to go like 0-5 or 0-10. He'd have to Mike Brown it. Well, he may do that. We'll see. We'll see. Mike Brown and <laughs> yeah, nice, nice notebook, bro. Exactly. But I, I'm just right now. I think there's there's some really good teams. I think teams though, like Minnesota, still has a long way long way to go. You got yeah. Houston with the nice kids that they got during the draft that looked really looked good in summer league, and they've got Christian Wood there, and they've mm -hmm. also got John Wall. I mean, I still think they're a long ways away from being competitive, but at least the future looks bright now after it was getting kind of bleak last season. Did John Wall have a surgery or any? Like, did did he use? Did he finally have a summer without injury? I feel like I think so. I think maybe he did. Yeah, maybe it's he been did. Like six seasons or something ridiculous with him, like not having like something like you know knee surgery, leg injury. This that it feels like. I think New Orleans has really made a lot of missteps this summer. I think uh, yeah. actually with David Griffin, ever since he's been there, he's made a lot of missteps period yeah. in not building a proper structure around Zion. And I think that's going to end up costing him. Is so, three, I, can I ask a question? Is yeah. it a three way race between who, which coach gets fired first or does Damian Lillard ask for a trade? Like which does, does, does I'm not sorry, not coach. Does David Griffin get fired before Luke Walton, before Damian Lillard asks for a trade? <laughs> I, I would say that Luke Walton would be my number one getting fired. Uh, but if David Griffin, it won't be too far behind if that's the case. I, I think it depends on the records out of the gate. Oh yeah. Uh, well, that's I, what I'm saying. I, I'm thinking either. Sacramento uh, Sacramento could easily have like a nice six and four record, seven and three, you know, if depending on the schedule, if they get a nice little cupcake schedule to start, that could give right. the momentum to be a competitive team. And then I could see it also going awry and being zero oh and eight coming out of the <laughs> gate, and then yeah, it all blows <laughs> up from there. I, I just it all depends to me on the schedule. If they're sent out on the road on the Eastern Conference first off, that would be brutal. Or if they're sent on a nice little West Coast package where you have like Utah and Denver in the same back-to-back -back and whatnot. That's like two losses there because they play so well at home. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I mean, it all depends on the schedule. And then the same thing with New Orleans. If they get that kind of schedule, that could be really rough for them going forward. The fact that they didn't really address a lot of the needs around Zion, I think that was a, a mistake. And then there are teams like Memphis. Memphis, yep. Yeah, which had such high hopes during the, you know, the season where they – played really well in the play-in. They, they made the uh, first round of the playoffs. And they they right. gave a lot of heart against Utah. Didn't quite right. come to fruition. But now you have a situation where they've kind of, I think, taken a step back with the trades. That they had the Steven Adams trade. It was, it was a cap move that they got a little bit of benefit kicker out of. And then they had uh, you know the Rondo trade the other day with Rondo and Beverly and – Dan Daniel Oturo going to them, the Grizzlies uh, for Eric Bledsoe. I'm not. That's to me. That's kind of a lateral move because I don't think they have much faith in Eric Bledsoe anymore. 
But Patrick Beverly, you know, if he gets waived, you know, it could be somebody that teams out there might be interested that need backcourt defensive help. Hint, 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 hint. I don't see. Well, I don't think. I don't. I mean, I'd be astounded if Pat Bev came to uh, the Lakers. Are you sure? I mean, we've already yeah. got our share of of guys that are willing to go over the top. Yeah, but I just don't see. I see him wanting a bigger role than we can offer him. I feel like I don't. Uh, know that, if he gets, if he, he's not going to have a bigger role in in Memphis because you've got the young kids you want to develop. You got obviously right. John Morant being the superstar in the making. So I'm not sure if you can go believe, ahead and. I believe there's 17 players under contract, and you can't yeah. carry that many. <laughs> Yeah, and you haven't seen anybody waived yet, so I think they're going to go ahead and, and test out what they're going to do with with Rondo and with right. with Beverly before they start the season on that. So I think that at least one of those two, if not both, will be moved before before the season starts. So looking forward to see where they end up. I still think Rajon Rondo, his future is coaching. I think he, he is going to be a good coach if he ever decides to do so. Maybe he should start into that if they buy him out. Uh, but we'll see. Somebody will try to pick him up, I'm sure. Rest assured. I think it'll be us. If he gets bought out, he'll, he'll, he'll finish his uh, career as a Laker. And that's the thing. Uh, Listen, I mean, he's gonna be, I'd rather have, would you rather have Rondo as the Jared Dudley? Or Jared, Jared. Dudley? No, I would have Ray John, Ray John Rondo, but it happened. If Pat Beverly gets released, you know, defensive backcourt help is exactly what you need. No, I agree. I mean, if, if Pat Beverly was willing to come here on the vet minimum, which is all we could offer him, uh, for a backup role to Kendrick Nunn, who shoots better, uh, and depending on matchups, Kent Bay's more. Uh, again, I think he'd outplay Malik Monk on the defensive end, so that would make Monk even more kind of like a, well, hey, you're on the team. <laughs> yeah, just uh, I mean, just something like that. I, Ray John Rondo would be, you know, a nice addition. But do they really need playmaking now? Now that they have Russ, and now that they have LeBron and THT and, THT and Kendrick Nunn, that would all want to buy for time. And Malik Monk, uh, they could all pretty much handle the ball a little bit. So yeah. you know, not, not all of them are great playmakers, but at least you're going to have people that can go ahead and, and take care of you in a pinch already. So. Having Rajon Rondo there may not be the best thing as a coach, yes, but not as a player. I'm not sure. I'm all apologies and respects to playoff Rondo, but you know, he wasn't playoff Rondo with the Clippers, so that's uh, he wasn't given the same role though. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't given the same role or time because Reggie Jackson right. was playoff Rondo. He was right, but wasn't. <laughs> well, Reggie Jackson played. He really, played really well, well, but he doesn't yeah. have the same way. And Trey Mann played well. Trey Man for a they're, they're, that's I mean that's the question. Do those guys again do they plateau or yeah. is, is do they take you know like how Keith took a step back a little bit? I felt for us last season. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are the things that you're never sure how some of those role players are gonna how how the role players break is always kind of key for your for like a game or two in your standings and then you know a series you know a game in a series or two throughout the playoffs, which you want those games. You don't want to lose those games if you can avoid it. Last um, team I want to go ahead and cover, and just right now, and we're we're just giving you thoughts on on who we think mm -hmm. is going to you know do well so far based on the knowledge we're going to have. It's not official, just casual talking right now because we're so early into the off season, and yes, I am including the summer league in the off season here. I want to ask you this: San Antonio, I think, is the only team we really haven't covered. I mean, unless you want to cover Minnesota with. Carl Anthony Towns, is he ever going to live up to the, you know, thing? Is he going to be just a stats guy? Is he is he going to be just an empty stats, empty calories guy? Or is he going to be something of substance uh, on for that team for, for Minnesota? I mean, that's up to you to decide, but it right now it's just been looking like a lot of empty stats. I mean, he's had terrible luck. He's had yeah. terrible luck. Injuries. Absolutely terrible luck. And his family. Family. like uh, I, So, in a way, I kind of hope I hope they... I hope they. I hope he does come out. He's a. He seems like a really nice kid. He has the tools. Is it? Yeah. Can he? Can he focus on the season? And I think help it. What would help him so much is if, incredibly, D'Angelo Russell was healthy. Uh, you know, Russell can soak up possessions. Uh, you know, he has been. He had a long off season injured. I think he's going to have you know more time to work on his game this off season. Yeah. And I think he mostly rehabbed last season. So. Uh, you know that could that could work out well. I mean, both those guys just got to show they're serious about playing in the NBA 
or, or I mean, obviously they're playing in the NBA, but do they want to excel or are they yeah. content to just be like, yeah, I made some money and I shot some shots and I was on a team and it was awesome. And, you know, now I have a used car dealership outside of Toledo or, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you have a short window to like, push yourself into the conversation of great players in the league in any given in any given season. And if you're able to do it like some of the greats have been able to do it uh, and maintain that being in that conversation each and every season, uh, that's when, you know, you you know you're an incredible player and a ridiculous talent and so on and so forth. So that's, that's the, you know, I feel like they're definitely on the outside of that kind of, you know, people talk about the great players of the league. I mean, again, you, you know, you made a great point. Statistically, you should – put cat up there uh as as a great player in the league because he does put up numbers but he doesn't win uh and you know a lot of excuses um is can they can they push through can they push past that and break that playoff drought you know which team breaks their playoff drought first sacramento or minnesota uh i'd bet on sacramento at this point um i think you know injuries are going to decide everything in both conferences of course if any of these guys we're talking about gets hurt it's like well now it's a new conversation so Last everyone being on, healthy everyone being healthy yeah i mean that's the only the only thing you can go off right now but we'll see what happens guys getting healthy hopefully that are on the mend and then hopefully everyone else can stay healthy with a team with a season that's a little bit more structured than normal yeah. last team uh, got to cover is san antonio and san antonio is a team that you know, uh, I don't know. I just, they made some puzzling moves. I mean, you give a lot of money to, uh, you know, just uh, Doug McDermott. I mean, yeah. Dougie, Buck Dougie McBuckets is, is, you know, a nice little player coming off the bench at 6'9". Sure. Sure. He'll give you, give you some three-pointers, but they signed him to a nice big fat contract to show you that shooting is the thing that pays the most right now right. in free agency. <laughs> and it just seems to me, though, that they just don't have enough talent and maybe who do you think they're gonna try to trade Doug for is I think the more like who who's that for right? Well, like, I told you last year I thought they had four candidates, four veterans, which they should have traded for some yeah. really good assets, and none That's, of them I not think one, right. not one. Not, Rudy Patty, Gay left, right? Rudy, Patty, Patty Demar, yeah. uh, and uh, oh, there's the fourth one that I'm gonna forget. But, uh, yeah, that, nothing. They got absolutely nothing from those. Worse than the Lakers. Worse than yeah. the Lakers. Letting Caruso and Schroeder walk them in. Uh, and they might have gotten a trade exception for Demar Derozan, but that's not yeah. the deal. They they could have gotten actual picks right. if he was traded to a contender or something like that last year. Same thing with Gay. Same thing with right. you know Patty Mills, and they lost them all, which is just mind boggling to me. But I think that maybe they have enough talent to get sneak into a play in scenario where maybe as a ninth or a tenth seed again. If if Pop has some magic left in his fingers, but that's a really tough ask. I think they're sliding on the way down instead of sliding I, on the way up. I agree with that. I think this could be the season that San Antonio doesn't make the play-in, doesn't make the playoffs. I don't think they made the play-in or the playoffs last season, did they? Is this the, is this the year he finally calls it and says it's as he's done? If he doesn't make the playoffs or play-in, I think so. Yeah, um, you're talking it, Popovich, right? Yes, of course. I think that's. I mean, when we're talking about the San Antonio, you know, that's really the qu the, the question in San Antonio is isn't almost about the players. It's like, what's Popovich going to do if they don't yeah. play well? Uh, and that's that's why I think he might because if it's about what he's going to do, then it's certainly not about the team. And he's an all about the team guy. And I don't think he wants to go out on the. I, th yeah. I think that's his hope that he can like push this bunch of nobodies into the playoffs, uh, and you know, kind of keep the ride going. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah. Uh, but if I think if Kat and Russell are healthy in Minnesota, I, I think they have more talent to push San Antonio out of the, you know, out of the picture a little bit. Um, well, there, there was a couple teams that we didn't mention. And I, I, I mean, I mean we, we, glossed over, we glossed over the Kings a little bit, you know, I, yeah, we glossed know. over the Kings. I, I, like I said, again, it could be touch and go with them. Oklahoma city. I love Poku. Pokashevsky and Shea Gilgis Alexander is going to be a superstar. I think at one point in time, possibly, I think he's being paid like it for Oklahoma yeah. city. So we'll see if that, but they've got 500 draft picks, but their season <laughs> is going to, they're, they're in full tank mode. Let's just, let's just cut, cut dry right there for, for you. For how much longer? It's been like, 
<laughs> it's going to be for a while longer. It's going to be for a while longer. But mm -hmm. then you have teams like Denver. They're going to be on the mend. How much they can they play at a competitive level until Jamal Murray gets back? I think when you have the reigning MVP, you're going to be always in, in competitive. How high? I'd probably see them right and run a fifth seed maybe, maybe even a fourth they could, they could pull off by the time Jamal Murray comes back. Yeah. Then you have Portland. Portland, a lot of people are losing faith in Portland and that implosion there. I know that's something that that uh, I think a lot of people are looking at for I think you know, Damian okay. Lillard being traded. You think they're going to do okay? I think they're going to be like six, seven. Okay. We didn't mention, though, Chicago. Chicago had a great oh, offseason. They, they don't play – yeah, but they don't play defense. Outside. Well, Caruso better be ready because he might be the only one that plays defense <laughs> on there. But you well, know, it's, it's, Lonzo plays some D. He's maybe not the stat guy, but he's 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 a ball hound. I, good I like he's a no, he's a he's a good team defender. I give you that. Right, I give right. you that. But this team is going to be all offense for the for majority yeah. of time in Chicago. So I'm I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing what they're going to do. I, th I think they are a little bit on the upswing, especially after that kind of off season, the kind of money they're spending. So. They better have a playoff team. I think that's the the directive and the ultimatum. Yep. And then last but not least, the Cleveland Cavaliers and Detroit Pistons. Detroit, obviously, with Kate Cunningham. This is going to be a big headache year. This is going to be a growing yep. year for him. He's going to take a lot of growing pains. Yep. We're going to see what he's made of out of it. I think by the end of this year, we're going to see if he's going to be able to advance to that next level. So we'll, we'll see on that. What are your thoughts on that? Or also as well, Cleveland. Cleveland, I don't know what they're doing. They they pay players like Jared Allen, like they're going to be a contender sometime soon. Right. Yet when you look at the team, it's just like it's just getting started. Well, yeah, I mean, who are they building around over there? Like, is it? Is it well, I'm is hoping it, it's Evan Mobley. I, but is it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, yeah. But Kevin Love is definitely the highest paid player, so you know they want to ditch Kevin Love's salary in any way, shape, or form. I don't know how they're going to do that this season. Yeah, it's going to be going to be uh, touchy. And uh, Colin Sexton, I know what they're going to keep Sexton. him. Well, yeah. I mean, at this point, he's one of the few. You know, I'm and I'm I'm kind of amazed he didn't get a deal before even uh, Schroeder did, which is you know. Well, he wants a max. He wants a max or close he's to it. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, yeah. That's you're crazy, bro. But. <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a you know, that's a whole other that's a whole other topic of debate. But yeah, I mean, those teams are certainly. I feel like, uh, you know, you could put uh, Houston, Minnesota, OKC, Cleveland, uh, Detroit. I think Detroit's probably even a step below those guys in terms of like having the, the ability to like break, have a breakthrough, have a breakthrough season and be okay. like, oh, they're, you know they're, I mean? they're going to be the bottom of the barrel, you think? I think so. Cause like who, who on Detroit? I mean, you're talking it's, Kate Cunningham. That's, and then but, Jeremy but, Grant. Uh, Jeremy Grant has not had, I mean, I guess you could say that. I, I, yeah, if he can play as well as he played when he played healthy and well, then and Cade can be solid. They can make a little bit of damage, but you know, like we were saying earlier, the East has gotten so competitive. Um, yeah. They don't. They don't have like like Houston. John Wall could have like a revived season, right? And like pull a Chris Paul and like take a bunch of nobodies to like a playing game and like you know challenge for an eight seed or whatever. Yeah. Um, who's there's nobody like that is I guess what I'm saying on Detroit. Well, um, if Christian if Christian Wood and John Wall blow up. Right. Then, then you've got, you know, and then obviously you have uh, Jalen Green there. You know, right. he's, he's he's a superstar in the making. I think he's going to be someone that you got to watch out for. He's looked incredible in the in on in summer league. So I think he might end up being might end up being better in the long run than Kate Cunningham. But we'll wait and see on that one. I'm still keeping my my eyes open on that. So. We'll wait and see, but yeah, I, I get you on that. That that Dent, that Detroit right now is probably the team with the least amount of talent and the longest way to go at this time. Just a, no way to break through in the East. That I, I mean, outside of like you know, everybody on Brooklyn dies, and <laughs> you know, like <laughs> and Boone and Simmons duel atop bridge and stab each other with rapiers. You know, that's the only way they're gonna punch through this season into a playoff conversation. So. 
Well, that, I tell you what, that's a great look at, at both the Eastern and Western Conference. One again, once again, I'm with my good friend, Mr. Jamie Sweet, Mr. Five Things on Lakerholics.com. But before we head on out, my friend, you heard Laker Toms, you heard Sean Grice, you heard Mr. Spencer Young, you, and you even heard my thoughts on the all-time top 10 Lakers. I was hoping for a little bit more of a great conversation at Lakerholics.com, but I haven't seen it yet, so... Didn't see that. I'm setting you guys up for a great conversation. And I'm hoping that there will be a Lakerholics.com on this. There will be. There will be. I hope so because I'd love to see here all the readers at Lakerholics.com think what their top 10 all time Lakers are. But yeah. that leaves you, my friend. What, who are your all time top 10 Lakers? From 10 down? From it's the best way to do it. I mean, people are going like one, two, three. I'm like, nah, you take all the bad. suspense out of it when you start at one. Right, exactly. Uh, for me, my tenth is probably. I mean, I'm gonna have to say both because I very much enjoyed watching him play. He wasn't a Laker for as long as some of the other guys on the list, uh, but my tenth best, best Laker is gonna be uh, one Pau Gasol. There's a good start off right there for you. That's he's actually been there, I think, on more one or more lists, right? In that nine ten area. So. Yeah, I mean, if he had been if he had finished his career with Kobe and they had a chance to like play it out under whomever was coaching him, uh, I think it, he would have, you know, been a little bit higher up on the list. Okay. Uh, but uh I put him, you know, kicking it off with a Spaniard at number ten. Okay. And number nine. Uh, nine, I got big game James, okay. that big game James at number nine. Uh, I like, you know, the thing about worthy is he was so good on a play on a team of other good guys, <laughs> great guys. One could argue, uh, guys who <laughs> be a little further down the list, uh, that he still managed to be as impactful of a player, uh, as he was and yeah. such a linchpin for those, late eighties champions, uh, championships, um, just with his, his skill and all around style of play, which was, you know, it was an elevated style of play for that era of basketball. And he was sort of, I always thought one of those guys who bridged over to, uh, what Michael ended up becoming, which was just the ultimate version of, of what James worthy could do at a, at a, at a less impactful level than, yeah. than Mike. Number eight. Number eight, probably a little higher than some people have on their list, but I'm going to go with Gail Goodrich. Okay. I think I've heard his name on one list already. I uh, think it was on Joe Soros of Lakerball.com. Laker Laker I, probably, I probably have him a little high. Some people probably have it, having him challenge for, uh, you know, power or worthy. Uh, I, I like The reason I like Gail is because of how not just how his career went where he kind of like really worked himself up from off the bench to, you know, uh, a, you know, all-star player uh, who part of an incredible teams, but also because he was the kind of player that I like, which is kind of a snub nose, tough minded defensive kind of guy mm -hmm. uh, who could still score the rock. You couldn't yeah. play the game, you know, in the era that he played without having solid fundamentals. He'd already gone to four years of college you had, you know, everything was refined in terms of a f foundational level for the most part um, in, the, in the era that he played. Number seven. Uh, number seven, I'm going to have uh, one Wilt Chamberlain. Okay. Some might want to put him higher. Well, you put him higher as an. I think you put him higher as an overall player, but I get I get what people have talked about when they put him down here for the Lakers exactly. because exactly. how many years did he play for the Lakers? Not many, won a championship, but that kind of the Pau Gasol phenomenon. But he's just so much better of a player that I feel like he earns a higher spot. I, you could argue, make an argument that in terms of like their actual Laker careers, Pau and Wilt are a pretty solid nine ten, but Wilt is just such a dynamic player, redefined the game. Um, it's hard not to put him it honestly it's hard not to put him in the top five <laughs> slot yeah. because of the way that he could play the game for so long um but uh you know i i, I will bring it in uh at number siete all right number six 
say so. All right. Uh, number six, I got Elgin Baylor. Okay. Obviously, a, an excellent choice there. Uh, I know that's falling right in where a lot of people have him slotted at. So there you go. I like Elgin. Uh, you know, everybody's probably a modern basketball mind remembers him as uh, the Cooper's GM uh, who got uh, got duked on by Donald Sterling. And uh, uh, that's just the part of his career that I would rather not think as much about. I mean, obviously, you know, you can't just ignore it or that it didn't happen. But, you know, he was such an incredible player. Um you know, kind of a LeBron James-esque player with his ability to impact the game on multiple levels on both ends of the court, but with such size and grace uh, and strength for that era. You know, he, yeah. nobody's nobody's going to look like the line the, the linebacker that LeBron looks like, or, I, you know, few, uh, I guess Zion kind of does, actually. Um, but, you know, Elgin had, you know, size and a, a, a grip ton of skill uh, and was just a classy guy. All right, so that leaves us now at number five. Who do you have for your all-time top ten Lakers at number five? So for the top five, a couple of the guys on the list are in the places that they are because of the impact that they had on the franchise after they've played. Um, it's not just their career on the court as a Laker. And some of the names on this list, you know, were – uh, if not Laker lifers, uh, you know, as close to it as you get in, in modern, in modern sports. Uh, so for my part, uh, both on longevity impact, uh, again, this isn't like a, 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 a critique of the player, but I have number, I have Shaquille Neal at number five. Okay. A little high, yeah. probably some people might feel like, um, no, I think that's in a range where a lot of people have him. I have him a little bit higher personally. Yeah, I mean, you can make an argument uh, that he and the next guy on the list, you know, could swap easily if, depending on, you know, how you think they impacted the game of basketball where they were Lakers. Uh, the next guy on my list at number four, uh, mm -hmm. Shaq at five, is uh, Jerry West. Okay. Again, because not only was he a great Laker player, uh, he was instrumental in putting together uh, several competitive and banner winning teams. In the years after he was a player, and you know, I think had it not been for Phil coming here, which ironically led to more championships, I think Jerry West would have been here longer. But you know, it, it worked out the way it worked out, uh, and I, I do hope someday uh, he comes back in some sort of role one last time, and then bids the basketball world adieu, and you know, rides ponies in Montana or whatever he does, whatever he, is, he does to relax, because he deserves to finally relax and not be so stressed out all the time. Yeah. Um, so now you had your four, you're right there. Pau Gasol, number 10, James Worthy at number nine, Gail Goodrich, number eight, number seven's Wilt, number six is Elgin, number five is Shaq, number four is the logo, Jerry West. What is your number three as we get into your top three Lakers of all time? Uh, this one's... Uh, this one, so he's he would be higher on this list if he had had more success success on the level that Jerry West did off the court with the Lakers. I have Magic at number three. Um, it's hard to put him not at uh, two or even one because he was a Laker lifer. Uh, he was he and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar were my first two earliest favorite Lakers from who I remember watching growing up myself growing up watching them play. Um, uh, but I have magic at number three, just because he was such a terrible coach, uh, and was just awful, 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 awful as a coach. Um, not great as a late night host, not uh, great as an executive and not great as an executive. Although he did, he did, you know, did, he had that one year, 2017 when LeBron James was like this, where's that yeah. pen? Thank you very much. And but he did, he did uh, he did have that one year you, you, they were successful and he helped coordinate the 2017 draft, which was 100%. a very good draft. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I but he, certainly not the level of success at that position as Jerry West had. Right. No. So that's, that's magic would be a little bit higher on the list. If, if he had either been through the, if he had been a part of the team as the, as the president, uh, when we won in the bubble, you know, if he had just found a way to like, let Rob just do his job and stand out in front of people and be like, Hey, uh, you know, I don't need uh, everybody's doing a great job. I'm out. You know, that's all I had to do. Uh, and he wanted to be, I don't, you know, I don't know what happened. So we'll, 
tampering, point. unfortunately, at times. That's what happened, where he couldn't, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> be a little bit more quiet at times. It cost the Lakers a little bit here and there, but <laughs> you know true. he is magic. He is magic, and, and exactly. obviously had one of the greatest pro basketball careers ever. So that right. leaves you with our top two. Laker lifer, Laker lifer, and Laker that's why it's hard to hard to put him at number three. Hard to put him at number three, but I I, I have to. Uh, number number two, uh, Alex it, Caruso, the greatest <laughs> of all time. Uh, off the bench, maybe. No, that would be Coop. And it was hard not to put it was hard not to put Coop in front of uh, Powell, to be honest. Uh, just because Coop was a part of more championship teams, um, you know. You could argue that guys like Jamal Wilkes, uh, Pau Gasol had better careers, but again, who was the better Laker? Uh, you know, Coop, Coop's right. He's he's my if if this if we if we were to spinal tap this and turn it up to eleven, Coop's probably my number eleven. Uh, but my number two Laker is the Cap Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Um, didn't spend his entire career with his Lakers, but spent the majority of his career with his Lakers. Obviously, had the best years of his life uh, as a Laker. Uh, was Did he have the best years of his career as a Laker? I mean, I think in terms of the power of the team that he was on, supporting his skill set, yes. Did he put up Good. better raw statistical numbers in Milwaukee for a couple of seasons? Yes. But, and he did have Oscar with him for his championship and, year. And he, had, and he had Oscar Robinson, who, you know. But I just think that, you know, the fact that he played so well for so long as a Laker as, and not just, you know, there are some guys who like, you know, like Kobe, you could argue, like didn't really fade, fade out his career the way Kareem did. Right. Like he kind of was like, it, it's going great. It's going great. I'm like a rocket entering the atmosphere. I'm getting bounced around here. I'm getting smashed up. And then my career is just kind of, kind of crash land on planet earth, but I got there. I did it, you know, cause he had so many injuries at the end of his career. Kareem had this ability to just be there to just be on the court and to impact the game on both ends of the court uh, well into his career, well into, you know, what many would consider NBA twilight years, you know. Uh, he wasn't the 40-year-old guy at the end of the bench like Udonis Haslam being like, you know, this is how you do it. He went out and did it uh, all the way through, and that was always a Laker, and that's one of the things I think uh, that gets overlooked a lot. You know, you don't lead the league in points by playing, having a short career. You, you yeah. know, you've got to have longevity. You've got to maintain your body in the off season. You've got to be, you know, for the most part, injury free, uh, major injury free. And, uh, you know, you've got to have the ability to score the basketball. And he checks all of those box boxes in, in a way that few players uh, even approach. Um, so that's why I have the cap at number two. Uh, the Jay, what are your numbers when number one is? I mean, I think it's probably everybody's number one. He's going to be, you know, just because of... Uh, the, the, hey, it wasn't everybody's number one. It was my number one, but he wasn't everybody's who number didn't one. Have, who didn't have Kobe at number one? I can't remember. You're going to have to find that out. Oh, I'm going I'm going back. I'm going back and watching it. Because I, I kind of listened to it at work, uh, and I didn't give it my full attention while I was there. It was a bad day at work, so that's part of the problem. But uh, anyway, I'm going to re I'm going to re-listen to... Uh, I, I gotta, I gotta see who didn't put Kobe at number one. I can, I have a guess actually. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, a, it's an easy guess because of, well, anyway, I'll, 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 I will, I will return with, I will return with that. But I've got Kobe at number one. Um, you know, again, a Laker lifer, uh, obviously a Laker lifer taken too far too soon. Um, but you know, all the names on this list, I'm not sure. I mean, he and Magic are the two that I would say like laid it out on the line for the Lakers the hardest consistently over their career. You know, Kareem was a great player, but there's always this kind of – he always kind of just floated above the team. He wasn't, you know, he, he was this like, you know, this UFO kind of <laughs> up above the team that was just like dominant force but never like, you know, connecting with a lot of the other guys. Yeah. Uh, or feeling, you know, in re in recent years, I think they've done a good job of, you know, trying to 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 enhance this image of his. But when he was a player, he was very aloof uh, a lot of the time, and and very, you know, if, with there's obviously really great reasons why that's true. Why he was like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, he was one of the most polarizing athletes of his era uh, for many years, um, and so. And even now, it's like you know they talk about the great players, and it's it's all it's mainly uh, you know wings and guards, and the cap is often forgotten in that conversation. Even though 
all those guys who had great shots did not have an unstoppable shot. He had an unstoppable shot. But the heart that Kobe Bryant uh, kind of gave to the Lakers, and, you know, like any relationship, it had its up and ups and downs. Um, but it really did feel like, and maybe it's just because of the era that I've been alive, but it felt like that the Lakers and Kobe and the fan base had this kind of relationship that it really only ever had with Magic Johnson, I feel like. Um, to where like you just wanted that person to do so very well <laughs> and you were very, very disappointed when they didn't uh, or when they did silly things. Uh, and, you know, it, it, I can't say if it's like a, a romantic relationship or a like a weird parent, you know, child relationship where you're like, but I want you to use the potty. Come on, man. Uh, you know, that kind of like, like willing them to do the right thing of, of that parents go through. I, uh, but I think you do that with your, with your relationships with people in general. So uh, they just have this really intense relationships with both of those players, which is why I have them both uh, one and two. Um, I mean, I could see an argument being made for Kobe going as low as three, uh, but that would only come down to how you weigh things off of the court. And so for me, I am looking at this more. Th I mean, cause then, you know, you could argue that a lot of guys should move around based on the things that they did off the court. So for me, I see Kobe as being number one because he gave his, the, he had the most heart for the Lakers of all the guys on the list. Uh, magic is he and magic are right there with one another. Um, and like I said, you know, Kobe never had a terrible late night show, so uh, that's why he beats Magic. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, uh, and he was actually, uh, I think, what an Academy Award winner for best for what, best short. Right, Magic didn't even get an Emmy nomination for his. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Oh man, no, I can, I can, I can. Um, I mean, and those names are all inter top five are all semi interchangeable to some degree, depending on the lens you look at in terms of like how you feel like the impact of the team overall play on the court importance in the history of the NBA uh, you know what they did off the court after the after they hung up the sneakers um, you know there's there's a lot to be there's a lot of ways you could look at the top five Lakers and, and switch them around um, but for the, in this case uh, that's how I got mine well there you go if you have any questions on Jamie Sweet's list or when it comes to Joe Soros' list, when it comes to my list, Laker Tom's list, when it comes to Sean Grice, when it comes to Spencer Young's list, we want to hear your thoughts at Lakers Fast Break, Lakers Fast Break at Yahoo.com, or the best place to go to have this conversation at Lakerholics.com. Hopefully, either Sean or maybe Laker Tom can post something like there on all of our stuff right there and and maybe people can gauge that because I think they just need a place to go ahead and make those comments. So I think that would be a great and spirited conversation to have in the next few weeks while we're waiting for the Lakers to come around to see who is everybody's picks for the all-time top 10 Lakers. I think that would just be a great conversation. And I you know, know maybe, gonna... maybe we can read some of our favorites off. Uh, yeah. If people put them out there, maybe we can uh, agree to say, like, hey, throw your conversation up there and we'll, we'll give you a shout out on the show. Absolutely. I'd love to hear your, their thoughts on that. Plus, I know that you and I and Laker Tom and Jamie at some point in time, excuse me, Sean Grice and, and Spencer Young and the whole nine yards, we're going to have to go ahead and get together on another all-time list, and that's the all-time top 10 NBA players. We're going to have to get together at some point in time to do that. That would be a tremendous, tremendous podcast. So I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to go ahead. But the problem is getting all you guys together when it's off-season like this it's, it's a little rough. Hard. It's, it's a little hard rough. to do. It's yeah. a rough. You know, can we also, can we just agree that if we're going to do that, we all have to take like a, a shot of uh, sake after everybody's top 10. And by the end, it'll just be a knock, knockdown, knuckle dragging fight about, you know, <laughs> you are no great boy. You no good. Well, just hearing Laker Tom and Sean Grice go back and forth on that would be priceless. That's for sure. Oh, and Spence, Spence, you know, you got shout out to Spencer, uh, his yes. website. I read a couple articles on that today. Um, well, t yeah, too, but both about the 76ers. Uh, I think his take on Ben Simmons is pretty spot on. Uh, 
it's one of the big it, – it feels like the off – you know, I not to swing it back to the teams in the East or anything, but, like, it just feels like the one unsettled thing in the off season uh, is what are the 76ers doing? Like, uh, uh, there seems to be just madness. <laughs> it seems to be madness. Well, we'll see if that madness continues, but there were some great thoughts right there all this time on not only the Philadelphia 76ers, but the entire NBA from a good friend, Mr. Jamie Sweet. Before we head on out, my friend, you got to go ahead and drop the knowledge on everyone exactly what you are doing with your five things column at Lakerholics.com. Well, I just wrote one of the few fivers that uh, Laker Tom has ever agreed with, which was the one I did on Westbrook. I made sure I put some things in there that he wouldn't agree with that I thought uh, Dwight Howard and Mark Gasol would both get minutes. Uh possibly as a starter um and he took you know he took like a on bridge with that as i kind of expected but uh you know uh at this point i'm i, I liked uh, i've i liked what we did in the off season i'm gonna start looking forward or moving forward rather and doing uh top five potential lineups uh on and off the bench um and along with uh, top five buyout candidates uh, that may happen even before the season begins. Um, I still think there's a lot of movement that is going to happen in the off season. Uh, Memphis alone has to, has to dump two players or do something about two players. Uh, and there's not a lot of like slots open for these guys. So yeah. it's going to be very, you know, uh, uh, it's just going to be very interesting to see how this works out. Um I could imagine a world where both Rondo and Beverly get bought out before the season begins. And I can imagine a world where they both somehow start the season in Memphis, but I don't see that being as very likely. It'd be kind of incredible. I, yeah, that would be kind of incredible indeed. And I just don't think at right now that, you know, obviously they're going to have to get rid of some individuals there, but you know, at this point in time, we'll wait and see. But I think that we should keep our eyes open as Lakers fans. If Patrick Beverly gets, pumped off that's the you know thing or bought out so I'm, I'm waiting to see if that will happen so well just to say wait and see right now because the lakers do have an open roster spot so it's just sitting there just sitting yeah. there and being i mean technically more than that but yes but i i th- i think there's going to still be a, at least one more move made for the lakers i think they have to make one more move i, I think, think so that, too yeah i think so too we didn't really actually we did talk about the lakers <laughs> Hardly at all in terms of the off season. Well, that's um, you know, there's been plenty of time for that. Yeah. yeah. But any last thoughts on the Lakers? I mean, also they can head to your five things column for a lot of Lakers off season. Time. Well, that's why the buyout slash remaining free agents is one of the topics I'm I'm I'm, I'm mulling over. And I I think the Lakers are might end up with Paul Millsap. Um, I know that that seems maybe like a lateral kind of move, but I think that he could be a PJ Tucker esque. Uh, guy to play like you know 15 ish minutes in the playoffs maybe 20 minutes during the regular season per game maybe not even that many during the regular season maybe like 18 17 um just to spell ad uh i think i would love to see a combination of rugged guys who can at least hit the three when ad is not on the floor and that means that's when i expect the gasol minutes to materialize could see some Millsop minutes if he's on the team. Ariza, Basemore, those kind of guys are going to have to carry those minutes when AD sits um, and help space the floor if if Russ and or LeBron is on the floor. So, um, you know, th- that's that's personally right now my – I mean, other than James Ennis, I should say this. James Ennis is my hope that somehow he ends up a Laker. Uh, Paul Millsap second, and that's where I would stop. I would – keep that last uh, roster spot open for a buyout in the middle of the season or just to give you some wiggle room if somebody comes available or whatever. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I'm looking forward to seeing if that happens. Plus also as well, can they pick up a spot for training camp that might help them out? Or will they let anybody go like Gasol? I think he's been rumored to say maybe he's not going to even start the season. We'll wait and see. Maybe even Bowie Cousins, a return for him possible anything is possible right now so we'll see what happens with the lakers but jamie it's been great to have you on board for this occasion i cannot thank you enough for stopping by any last thoughts on the way out no you know great show john had a lot of fun 
I had a lot of fun too. I mean, our numbers are out there getting bigger all the time, and it's truly appreciated for everyone out there watching us on LakersBall.com, watching us out there on Facebook, watching us out there on Twitter, or wherever you get us out there at Lakerholics.com as well. Kenna, thank you enough. On YouTube, got to give our supporters of YouTube a big hello. And in fact, if you get a chance, please subscribe to our channel. Our stuff drops there all the time. So mm -hmm. we truly appreciate that. Got some great conversations on the way, still yet to come in the coming weeks, like especially with this guy right here. He is going to go ahead and be a great part of what we're doing here. And I cannot thank you enough for being by right now, right here in the middle of the off season with his thoughts on the NBA right here at the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. <laughs>